The following is an overview of operations conducted at the Grand Theater level during the American Civil War in December 1860. In December 1860, Abraham Lincoln is the president-elect, the election occurring the previous month. However, Lincoln will not be inaugurated until March. President James Buchanan's administration is in its final months. On December 1, 1860, the United States consists of 33 states. This status will change this December. Sliding over to the west, it's important to remember that California and Oregon are states in December 1860. With the exception of these two Pacific states, Texas is the furthest state westward. We will slide back to the east. Above Texas is the Indian Territory, modern Oklahoma, and above that is Kansas. Kansas has nearly finished its process in joining the Union as the 34th state, but in December 1860, Kansas is still a territory. The regular United States Army is tiny in 1860, with about 16,000 men in uniform. Defense was largely passed on to state militia. There were some 115,000 active militia among all the states in 1860. New York and Pennsylvania had the largest active state militias with 19,000 men in each state. Virginia had the next largest militia in 1860 with nearly 14,000 men. South Carolina had 7,000 militia in 1860. This state militia will play a pivotal role in the events of December 1860. Massachusetts and Ohio each had about 5,500 men in their state militias. No other state in the country had more than 5,000 active men in its state militia. In December 1860, the eyes of the nation turned toward South Carolina. The previous month, at Columbia, South Carolina, legislatures had authorized a convention for secession. Secession talk is the most impassioned and enthusiastic in South Carolina and was in motion immediately following Abraham Lincoln's election in November. However, there is a serious numbers problem for South Carolina. South Carolina has those 7,000 active militia in 1860, which is one of the larger state militias at the time. However, New York State alone has almost triple that figure with 19,000 men. New York and Pennsylvania together have some 38,000 men. Just these two northern states have over five times the militia ready in 1860. However, if South Carolina can convince Virginia to join the secession movement, Virginia's 14,000 men added to South Carolina's 7,000 men raises the rebel forces to 21,000. The odds are still long, but a defensive campaign might be able to hold off the larger states long enough for other states to join the rebellion. Contrastly, if Virginia remains loyal to the United States, the odds essentially become hopeless for South Carolina and the Deep South states that are considering secession. Virginia plus New York plus Pennsylvania would raise the large state militia numbers to 52,000 men against just 7,000 in South Carolina, essentially impossible odds for the Palmetto State. Many Southerners beyond South Carolina by December are supporting secession but they know they need to somehow cooperate amongst themselves with regard to the timing of secession. These cooperationists realize that the states have to synchronize their secession so the odds are not entirely stacked against them. So there is an incredible enthusiasm for a secession in South Carolina in December 1860. However, cooler heads realize that they must get other slave states, especially populous Virginia, into their fold. Nevertheless, on December 3rd, delegates to the South Carolina Convention have been selected. So South Carolina, just one month after Lincoln's election, has gone from authorizing a convention to selecting people to be at that convention. December 6th, the Anderson Intelligencer, the newspaper of Anderson Courthouse, South Carolina, reports that Virginia had declined South Carolina's invitation to join a convention of southern states. Yet the rebuff from Virginia does not stop secession fever. On December 9th, 10,000 muskets are sold from the Watervliet, New York arsenal. 
These weapons are suspiciously removed to Savannah, Georgia. Also, firearms manufacturers in the North are reporting large numbers of purchases from Southern buyers. On December 14th in Washington, President Buchanan calls for a National Day of Fasting and Prayer on the first Friday of January. As in his words, the union of the states is at the present moment threatened with the alarming and immediate danger. On the same day, in the same city, certain congressmen from the cotton-growing Deep South address their constituents, affirming, The argument is exhausted. We are satisfied the honor, safety, and independence of the Southern people require the organization of a Southern Confederacy, a result to be obtained only by separate state secession that the primary object of each slave-holding state ought to be its speedy and absolute separation from a union with hostile states. One of the congressmen affirming this address is Senator Jefferson Davis of Mississippi. December 15. The widely distributed publication, The Southern Presbyterian, reported that the Columbia Convention delegates, even before the convention is in session, are unanimous in their support for secession. On December 16th in Georgia, the legislature recommends a convention to secede from the United States. December 17th, in Columbia, South Carolina's convention is now in session. David Jameson is named president of the convention. The next day, December 18th, the Columbia delegates take the train to Charleston, avoiding a smallpox epidemic. There in Charleston, the convention is now in session. The delegates have a committee to draw up an ordinance for secession. The convention will also ask Washington to cede all federal properties within South Carolina to the state. The convention elects representatives to meet with the governments of other slave states to form a Southern Confederacy. On December 19th, up north in Ravenna, Ohio, the Portage Sentinel predicts what is unfolding, stating, There is no use in disguising what is before us. Cool and sagacious observers see no prospect of avoiding a rupture. By the 1st of February, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida will be out. At this time, President James Buchanan presents essentially a disassociated response to the crisis. Buchanan personally wants the Union to remain together but he does not believe his office has any power to avoid a separation. On the one hand, the United States will continue to collect revenues from South Carolina. On the other hand, the government has no power to coerce a seceding state back into the Union. December 20th. In Charleston, South Carolina's convention adopts an ordinance of secession, a unanimous decision of 169 to 0. The ordinance repeals South Carolina's ratification of the United States Constitution. Thus, South Carolina officially secedes from the United States of America. From the perspective of South Carolina state government, South Carolina is now an independent nation, the so-called Palmetto Republic. That day, large 100-gun salutes in support of South Carolina's secession are sounded in Mobile, Alabama, Pensacola, Florida, and Montgomery, Alabama. The next day, December 21, an enthusiastic secession meeting occurs in Mobile, Alabama. By now, Charleston, South Carolina, one of the largest cities in the South, and now a self-declared foreign city, is the center of the nation's attention. We will zoom in to Charleston, South Carolina. December 26, in Charleston Harbor at Fort Moultrie, United States Army officer Major Robert Anderson knows his position is endangered. The small United States garrison is isolated in a state that has just declared its separation from the Union. Anderson had requested more support, but the Buchanan administration seems strangely unconcerned about the security of one of its largest southern ports. And there is a reason why Anderson is not receiving support. The Secretary of War is John Floyd of Virginia, a pro-secessionist conspirator set within the Buchanan administration. Floyd is actually working to have the forts in Charleston abandoned, leaving the city undefended. Thus, Anderson is without support. On December 26th, 
Anderson transfers troops from Fort Moultrie to Fort Sumter. Anderson is now isolated in the center of Charleston Harbor and the United States fortifications ringing the harbor are open for seizure by South Carolina militia. On the next day, December 27, Fort Moultrie is seized by South Carolina militia. Castle Pickney is also taken. So in December 1860, we have the seizure of United States fortifications, armaments, and supplies by rebel forces in Charleston Harbor. Major Anderson is now sitting in Charleston Harbor, surrounded. We will zoom out. December 29. In Washington, Secretary of War John Floyd's suspicious behavior has caught up to him. Floyd resigns. Newspapers across the country are realizing the extent of Secretary Floyd's suspicious and likely illegal activities while at the head of the War Department. Revelations emerge that well over 100,000 muskets have been suspiciously transferred from northern arsenals like Springfield, Massachusetts, Watervliet, New York, and St. Louis, Missouri, down to the south. It is also revealed that Floyd was also trying to remove all United States troops, including Anderson's garrison, from Charleston Harbor. In December 30th, back in Charleston, the United States arsenal is seized by South Carolina militia. F.C. Humphreys, the military storekeeper at Charleston, wired a one-sentence communication to the Ordnance Bureau in Washington containing a most awkward, peculiar, and ominous message. Humphrey stated, This arsenal has today been taken by force of arms. What disposition am I to make of my command? On the final day of 1860, Humphreys, the military storekeeper at the Charleston Arsenal, communicated again to the Washington, D.C. Ordnance Bureau. This message provided more details. Humphreys reported that John Cunningham, Colonel of the 17th Regiment of South Carolina, had demanded the immediate surrender of the United States Arsenal. John Cunningham had acted with the authority of South Carolina's Governor Francis Pickens. On December 1, 1860, the United States consisted of 33 states. By the end of the month, South Carolina had seceded from the United States. South Carolina's regiments have secured important fortifications and arsenals in Charleston. A single garrison under Major Anderson remains at Fort Sumter, increasingly surrounded and isolated. This turn of events all occurred months before Abraham Lincoln's inauguration.